Aw, oh, snap, here we go again. Another boy group succumbing to the music industry's insidious scheme. The victims, B2K, minus the cornrow sporting ninja who had an icebox where his heart used to be. The perpetrator, Chris Stokes, allegedly. An acronym for Boys of the New Millennium, B2K brought in Y2K, soothing everyone's anxieties from the supposed Y2K panic that had y'all hoarding Chef Boyardee canned goods and Campbell's soups like your lives depended on it. Well, I guess it did. But fortunately for y'all, Lil Fizz, J Boog, Raz B, and Omarion were there to give you a dose of escapism that you didn't know you needed. They came, dropped a few bangers, a film, and dipped all the way before they reached their fifth birthday as a group. Since then, the members have all gone their separate ways, leaving behind an unresolved trail of secrets, animosity, and crimes that hadn't left the premises of B2K's unsturdy foundation until now. Ushering in the wave of all black male groups like Jagged Edge, 112, Day 26, and all of the other now defunct groups who were given promises just for those promises to be torn to shreds by everyone's favorite money hoarder, Sean Brother Love Honey Puff Diddy Daddy Sugar Cone. The creation of B2K came about as a creative project put together by dancer and choreographer Dave Scott and Interscope Records a and Keisha Gamble. Coming about in 1998, the history of the boys of the new millennium is kind of iffy depending on who you ask. Ask Omari or Marianne Granberry, then it appears to be more simple than if you were to ask Jarrell J. Boog Houston, Demario Raspy Thornton, or Dro Lil Fizz Frederick. Ask them and you'd most likely get hit with a more complex answer. Ask any of them about their departure as a foursome, and well, you get hit with a whole lot of lot of that'll leave you more confused than Stevie Wonder flying the plane, which shockingly he's confessed to doing, twice. Fizz, Rasby, and Jay Boog were already an item in the year of 1998. Two more members being dropped from the group like Hot Pockets, urging the guys to seek another group mate. It hadn't been till New Year's of 1999 that their missing link would cross their paths. Inviting Omarion to the group was a no-brainer. He was good-looking, charismatic, and could pop lock his butt off. Spinning the block on the whole, depending on who you ask, segment. Some say that the group actually met at one of J Boog's relatives' parties and not Omarion's, like magazines like Word Up wanted you to believe back in the day, stating that the group met at J Boog's first cousin, Marcus Houston's 18th birthday party. But according to the guys, that just isn't correct. The product of Los Angeles, California, despite all being inner city children, these inner city kids never in a million years would have hung out with each other if it weren't for the powers that be pulling them in each other's direction. Fizz, the Nola-born Creole Phil crooner, and not black again or Blasian like they again wanted you to believe, wanted you to believe, as if his government name didn't give it away, will be the first to tell you that the guys would have never been the guys if Keisha and them never introduced them to each other. Bamboozling the public was the game those in the music industry played a lot. Obviously, they can't get away with doing all that lying and plotting nowadays thanks to Wikipedia and all the nosy sources all around the internet. But boy, did they have a field day lying about ages, relatives, the mansions owned, and a whole lot of masterpiece scheming. Aside from a good majority of BET viewers convinced that Omarion and Marcus Houston were brothers for a long period of time, does anyone remember when they tried to convince us that Fizz and Janae Iko were cousins? Contractually glued together in 1998, then 99, B2K didn't really launch until around 2001. Breaching mainstream success with the Tricky Stewart produced debut single, Uh Huh, the repetitive dance record peaked at number 37 on the Billboard Hot 100, and its music video features a young Janae Aiko. Their self titled debut album, B2K, soon followed, peaking at number 2 on Billboard's Hot 200 chart. The team's first ever album went on to become certified gold and includes the singles Gas to Be and Why I Love You. Nearing the end of the year, Mission B2K global domination was in full effect and J Boog, Raz B, Lil Fizz, and Omarion were plastered, more so their posters, over the walls and ceilings of preteens and teen girls everywhere. Don't get it confused though. B2K had some of the fellows swooning as well. Boys wanted to be them and girls wanted to be with them. The Scream tour with Lil Boward Woward would soon come about before returning in 02 with their fourth single, Bump Bump Bump. Need, 
You know yeah. I like it when your body goes bump, bump, bump. That had all of us bump, bump, bumping. Written by R. Pissy and featuring P. Diddy, Bump, Bump, Bump would be B2K's little sample for their sophomore project, Pandemonium. The boys would later announce their decision to retire songs written by R. Kelly due to, well, you know. Pandemonium went on to debut at number 10 on Billboard's Hot 200, but peaked at number one on the Hot 100, becoming their first ever number one hit that would be the last time a boy group sat atop the charts for 16 years, only to be broken in 2019 by the Jonas Brothers. Although we don't hear much from boy bands or boy groups nowadays on the mainstream scale, the new millennium wasn't an uncommon commodity for such groups. Boy groups who were more on the unseasoned side, like in Sync, 98 Degrees, and the Backstreet Boys, were recognized on the main stage. However, groups like B2K were different. The obvious being that B2K were, in fact, black. They oozed hip hop drip and had swag that no other group at the time could imitate. No matter how many black male performers Justin Timberlake studied in his free time, their music video for the song Girlfriend, starring Jennifer Freeman, AKA Light Skin Claire from My Wife and Kids is a great example of B2K's quirkiness and what differentiated them from the rest of their peers. Produced by then manager Chris Stokes, the music video assembled an elite cast of black musicians, actors, and actresses, ushering in Vivica A. Fox, Ronald Isley, Flex Alexander, and Will Smith to aid in the visual storytelling of the black teenage saga. Their vocals, sung 90% by Omarion, had more attitude. The lyrics painted a sense of maturity. Their moves flowed with ease. The oversized velour jackets and overall style appeared to have more of an edge compared to their kids Bob and Disney sound and pop counterparts. They had all the ingredients to make them what they call ghetto superstars. From the show to the limo to the club and to the air show nothing. Being ghetto superstars earned them a plethora of award nominations, including several BET and VMA awards. They'd won their first Kids' Choice Award in 2003 for Favorite Singing Group and even filmed an iconic urban dance film, You Got Served. B2K had everything it took and did everything they could to become one of the biggest boy groups of all time. But things eventually took a turn for the absolute worst. By the time You Got Served was released, the group disbanded without warning, leaving B2K fans everywhere devastated. An announcement by group manager Chris Stokes letting it be known that B2K is a hip hop and foursome would soon be obsolete and their journey together would be no more. Stokes cited internal disagreements as the cause of their split with him and their label, Epic Records. We'd soon find out that J-Boog, Fizz, and Raz B were given the boot, but frontman Omarion was on board for his next expedition as a solo act under Chris Stokes' guidance. The other three members soon came out with a statement on their own, stating that they just wanted to be treated fairly. It wouldn't be until years later that Fizz and the rest of the gang would come out and tell us all the scoop on what really went down during their younger years. And PSA, it's a mess. But it wasn't like Fizz just came out of the woodworks and decided to pour this abundance of tea into everybody's mugs. And yes, I said everybody's, cause dude had enough spillage to fill a villain. But before we jump decades ahead to B2K minus Omarion's appearance on Revolt's Drink Champs podcast, I'ma back it up to the year 2022, when Omarion and Mario gave us one of the funniest versus battles we've seen thus far. Watermelon munching aside, it was all in good spirit, but the moments leading up to the big night didn't go without problem. When an eager fan asked via the comment section on Instagram if Omarion was singing only his songs or dipping into B2K's catalog as well, Omarion took it upon himself to reply back, I am B2K. To add a little Laris to the already seasoned situation, once O finally arrived to the versus battle, Mario joked about Omarion dipping into the B2K bag, to which Omari made it known loud and crystal clear that he sang majority, if not all, of B2K's hits and T-Ways. So that really B2K's music is his music. Needless to say, the rest of B2K wasn't feeling the slight shade and responded with a comical diss of their own. Raz B posted a clip of David Ruffin from the Temptations movie to his IG page, suggesting that that was what Omarion was acting like during the battle. 
In case you weren't aware of why that was Sly Shade, David Ruffin was the Temptations' lead man, but acted as if the rest of the Temps were nothing but background performers. Omari was giving every bit of I'm David Ruffin and these are the Temptation. Following the verses, Raz, Fizz, and Boog took to Raz B's page to comment, you got served. Simultaneously under the David Ruffin clip, poking fun at Omarion since according to the vast majority, Mario had won the battle. This immediately stirred the beef rumors to which Omarion confirmed in an IG post of his own. Omari's post started off with gratitude towards his supporters, the jokes, and his longevity he's been blessed with in the business. But the post eventually took a huge turn, and boy was it a read. To my three background dances, I'm not surprised because this is how y'all always been while in the group. Praying for my downfall. Well, keep praying because I'm overbooked and busy. Meanwhile, y'all really gotta get a job other than hating on O. I heard UPS is hiring. Hashtag hating from outside the club and can't even get in. From the mouth of Omarion, his fellow B2K members, Ben had a problem with him. During their Scream tour back in the day, the other three were already planning on doing their own thing, ostracizing Omarion from the festivities and were already on some divisive-ish. In fact, Omari says the group almost threw hands right then and there while on tour. And after discovering the group split to some unfair treatment, according to the other three, let Fizz tell it. The group planned on overruling Chris Stokes' term as their manager, given that he was giving special treatment to Omarion. But before they gotten the chance to do so, Chris broke the group up. And how'd Stokes find out about their little plot? According to Fizz, it was Omarion who snitched to Stokes, ruining their plans of firing him as their manager, all because of conflict between Omari and the other boys was already brewing due to favoritism of Omarion on Chris Stokes' end. And again, according to Fizz, Fizz took a girl from Omarion that Omarion liked at the time, and Omarion wasn't here for it. When Stokes confronted the other boys about wanting to get out of their contracts, allegedly Stokes had also brought up the fact that he knew about Fizz messing with a girl Omarion liked, which is how Fizz found out Omarion snitched in the first place. In short, it all boils down to management, shady business practices, and a whole bunch of he said, he said. Being an entertainer, the guys were in awe of the fame, glitz, and recognition. But notice they didn't make a single penny from the Scream Tour. Whole meanwhile, Chris Stokes was riding around in fancy cars and dripped down in designer every time they saw him. Also, according to both Jay Boog and Fizz, Fizz and Boog were the fan favorites during the height of B2K. And despite all the work Omarion was putting in, B2K fans just weren't feeling him as much as they were feeling Fizz and Boog. With all the turmoil going on within the group, we get hit with yet another bombshell via everyone's favorite Cheetah Girl and 3LW member. Please note the quotes, Keely Williams, who couldn't wait to open that gap-filled mouth of hers and confess, unprovoked, that three-fourths of B2K ran a train on her. Okay, she didn't say all of that, but she did say she was messing around with B2K minus Omarion around the same time. Whatever that means. When the Millennium Tour was announced back in late 2018, B2K fans were ecstatic. However, B2K barely made it as the group disbanded yet again after a few shows in, and it had been announced in 2020 that Omarion would continue the tour without his groupers. Omarion even put out a documentary documenting the court battle with the mother of his kids, April Jones, and behind the scenes leading up to the tour titled Omega, The Gift and the Curse. In the doc, we witness Raz B have several breakdowns and eventually opt out of the tour altogether, citing that he didn't feel safe due to Chris Stokes lingering around. Way back in 2007, Raz had come out and told the world that Chris Stokes sexually assaulted him when he was a child before even becoming a part of B2K, an allegation that has been attached to Stokes since. In Omarion's documentary, Omari does his best to soothe and console Raz as he goes through emotional ups and downs and pointed out how Jay Boog was mocking Raz B's pain by wearing a shirt that said, I don't feel safe. Omarion Ben stopped dealing with Chris Stokes and his fake industry brother, brother after all the hoopla surrounding Stokes and Marcus allegedly marrying a woman, a missing person who he allegedly groomed and dated when she was just 15, on top of Jay Boog still dealing with Stokes, Fizz dating Omarion's baby mama April just a few years before the Millennium Tour, making it indirectly be known that he 
he does tend to go after Omarion's women specifically. And Omarion not saying a peep about what really happened to B2K until recent years, only after the rest of B2K spoke negatively on his name time and time again, trying to paint a blurry picture. I think we can all see why Omarion don't mess with them people, but I'm not here to sway anybody's opinions. I'll leave that up for y'all to decide. B2K's journey of birth, departure, rediscovery, and a reunion that wasn't really a reunion was laced with a whole lot of deceit, inner turmoil, and drama that honestly, we still don't know who or what to believe. As far as we can tell, unfortunately for B2K fans, the boys aren't getting back together anytime soon. And this saga may just continue on into Y3K. Maybe by then the guys will put their differences to the side and finally reunite in a way the fans crave once and for all. Maybe not. As of recently, Omari is still doing him. Fizz is spreading his cheeks for the world to see, allegedly. Raz is still battling his own mind, aren't we all? And Boog is somewhere chilling like a villain outside of the public eye. Do you think B2K will ever come back together? What do you think really broke the group up? Let us know your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments and stay tuned for more true celebrity stories.